thank you. Financing mining is a, a, a narrow topic, as you can imagine. So there's a few di different directions we can go on this this evening. Um, I think the first point to make, thank you for you know, your interest tonight. I'm uh, really delighted to speak to you all. And furthermore, it's a topical time um, for our company, but also for the sector. Um, by way of introduction, Equora Resources, or for the folks who are familiar with Anglo-Pacific Group, is uh, we are the leading royalty company focused on financing uh, the production and operation of commodities um, that are required for a sustainable future. And by that, you know, you, you've touched on this earlier, but you know, just to give some context to, to how we view the world as an investor in the mining sector, we've deployed hundreds of millions of dollars to reposition our portfolio such that our, our exposure by 2026 will no longer have materially any coal exposure um, and consists primarily of cobalt, nickel, copper, or uranium. And not only that, but commodities produced in a very sustainable way with a very low carbon footprint. So the bigger question here, and I think we collectively as a room, we probably all agree with one another. The, there is a challenge in terms of meeting sustainability objectives and the production of raw com commodities. Uh, in, in the panel, it was discussed some of the challenges that exist in terms of operating mines in local communities. The, the other side of that coin, however, is ultimately attracting the capital to the mining sector such that these operations can be developed and built. Because it's easy for us collectively as an industry to forget that the mining sector represents a small portion of investable equities, um, of capital deployed across all, all sectors, and our ability to solve our climate change and ultimately reduce our carbon footprint to some degree is a function of the mining sector's ability to attract capital. And changing the perception of the mining industry is a huge part. And taking a step back, you know, I read some figures earlier this week that quantified the challenge ahead. And I would invite some, some comments if anyone has thoughts as to how many mines folks actually think are required just to achieve the level of EV production that's being targeted by the OEM. So starting with graphite, and to help folks here have a bit of context, there are 70 graphite mines in the world today. So any, any guesses as to how many incremental mines are required to be built and in operation in the next decade? Okay, someone's clearly read Benchmark Minerals in the back. Uh, I, I had someone say 7,000 and someone say 100. So okay, so I, uh, yeah, quite, quite the disparities, 100. Um, so in other words, in the next 10 years, we need to finance, build more graphite mines that are in the operation in the world today. Similarly, lithium. In Australia, the world's largest producer of lithium, you know, there are 13 producing mines that have been built, let's call it the last decade. Uh, it's estimated that 60 more are required. Um, there are some really well capitalized and some very large mining companies. There's no doubt about it. But this challenge and the scope of the challenge is far beyond the Glencores and the Rios and the BHPs of the world. Um, it, it, it goes down to exploration and development. So then from here, we touched on part of the challenge of perception in local communities, but it's a much bigger problem also, or an equal problem rather, in terms of attracting capital. Um, what is a perception of mining? First of all, often mining is part of the problem and if folks finance it as a mining industry, they're inherently perpetuating an issue as opposed to being part of the solution. Uh, mining is old world in a digital world you know, folks get much more excited about Google than they do about graphite. And furthermore, there's this lingering image in many people's minds of, of you know, the, the, the miner with a pickaxe going into a mine shaft. And while it's a regrettable that some, in some instances, those circumstances exist in the world, that's really not the case for the vast majority of, of metals produced and sold globally. 
So the perspective that some have at the extreme, of course, is that the world would be a better place if all mining operations stopped, which is a unique perspective. And personally, I think about that a bit like the airline industry or the aviation example, where in the world, there's roughly 36 million flights in a year. And the vast majority of those flights go really, really well. And no one ever hears about them. Occasionally, regrettably, and unfortunately, you know, they're incidents. And yet the people continue to fly. You know, there's no, it's a very unusual reaction to view the mining sector and the financing of the mining sector in a binary way. Either you mine or you don't. And responsible mining is clearly the bridge here. The mining industry has gotten a lot better, but there's a lot more work the mining industry can do, really, in our opinion, to daylight some of the exceptional and incredible things in the industry does for local communities, um, environment, as well as just generally in terms of promoting development um, in areas that you know arguably are not urban. There are not many mines within the boundaries of London. Uh, mining is often impacting communities that otherwise you know, face some, some, some hardships in, in meaningful ways. Part of the solution maybe is that the mining industry should show images of a remediated mine rather than actually an open pit, because in many ways that would be boring, but that would be much more compelling and, and help challenge and help change this perception issue. So what, what do we think, or if we're looking into the future, well, fi the financing that the mining sector is going to attract, in part, is going to come from OEMs. And we think that that will cause a lot of the industry participants to take another look at the sector and to think about the sector differently. Um, we also see the beginnings of sovereign capital in the West, governments prioritizing capital into the mining sector, both upstream and downstream in terms of pro primary production, but also processing and refining capacity. But the bottom line is, you know, the typical mining project is a five to 10 year, uh, excuse me, the typical mining project we, we wish as an industry is, is 20 to 30 years from exploration to production. Um, and so what's also unfortunately likely to happen is at some point in, in the potential medium term, commodity prices will hit such levels that it'll be impossible to read a newspaper without seeing a headline as to the shortages of these raw materials. And that in itself is like to be the catalyst, but it's unfortunate because price volatility is not helpful in, in, in a number of ways. Nevertheless, this lack of investment creates circumstances for substantially higher prices. And the challenges themselves are likely to change the perception and the role that the mining sector has, and therefore, in our view, attracts substantially more capital. But out of every challenge, the bottom line is there's always an opportunity, and at core Resources, as a permanent financier to the mining sector, um, for us, you know, that's an attractive entry point for the folks in this room who are here. Clearly, you recognize as an investor the merits of the sector. Um, we will continue in the interim to continue to position our portfolio for three key thematics. First of all, renewable energy production and the commodities required to do so, the transmission of renewable energy, and last, storage and EVs. And by storage, I mean energy battery storage. Um, this is what we've done, and we think that we're increasingly going to be part as a group, collectively, of a much larger wave of capital to the sector. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Please stay there. Uh, stay there for some questions. Look, I, um, I loved what you said. Obviously, as an investment journalist, I loved what you said because we get in all these discussions about mining and countries and people forget people, investors don't have to risk their capital in your project. They don't have to risk their capital in your country. Um, just a couple of questions listening to you. I've got, do you think that there's a lack of realism and it's a bit of a leading question, because I definitely think there is. But you know when you get like a car manufacturer and they pledge we're going to be 100% EV by 2040, 
And I'm sitting there thinking, there's no way you're going to build that many mines in the Andes. Or the politicians, when they, they'll make some green pledge. Do you think there's a complete lack of realism when they're making these pledges faced with the reality on the map that we can see there? Well, I would never bet against technical innovation. I, I mean, we rolled out and vaccinated an incredible amount of people in, in what, 12, 18 months during the COVID pandemic. So when there's clearly a will and a political desire, there's a way. Um, part of the question though is what, is what is the cost and what sort of amount of capital will need to be directed towards achieving these initiatives? And that's a painful decision as, as you know, they're, 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 these clearly entail uh, trade-offs. The other point that we've raised indirectly but is probably worth addressing The auto industry today is a business that competes on the driving experience, um, brand perception, the ability in the future to secure raw materials to produce those vehicles is going to create the new reality in the auto sector. And surely that will create winners and losers amongst the auto sector. Um, most folks today will happily buy a car never thinking about where the raw materials come from. Um, that, that's unfortunately not going to, um, it's an, that's an unfortunate trend rather. And, and we think it's going to change, you know, things like tracking of commodities from the mine site recorded with the carbon emissions associated to one unit of that commodity will likely be available to consumers when they make a purchase, purchasing decision of the automobile. So sorry, just you would buy a Tesla that has been produced with clean cobalt, not being produced by child labor, or it's, you're talking about those sorts of factors coming Precisely, to you know, so I think my, my, my conclusion is, I, I don't think necessarily it's an insurmountable challenge. I just feel like the folks who recognize these challenges and act quickly, and you're already seeing it, um, or we saw an investment from GM uh, with the past 20, 48 hours, the folks who act quickly will be those who are positioned to achieve these objectives and the folks who don't will may unfortunately challenge, uh, excuse me, uh, struggle with these challenges. Um, just a very quick one, because this is really going outside my pay grade, but that what you're talking about where the control of the supply of these critical resources becomes more important, will that, will that play to the advantage of Latin America, which for a lot of these resources, let's say nickel, Brazil has lots of nickel, copper, we've, copper we've already talked about, more than 50 cents of lithium, the, the scenario you're describing, is that positive for some of these countries in Latin America? Well, I would say it's probably less a matter of control and more ability of accessing supply. You know, think about it in other words, what is the value of a life jacket when there are 10 people on the raft and there are only five life jackets, right? And that's the challenge in that producing the sheer volume of these commodities is um, surely going to be difficult. Uh, not impossible, but difficult. And we're likely to see circumstances of supply deficits, which of course will encourage thrift, substitution, demand destruction, um, but still, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's a matter of having a, um, direct control and, and, and managing that, that supply. It's more from the perspective of the end market, just, just accessing it and having a certain and secure supply. Listening um, to your presentation or, or to your talk, something that struck me, you talked about higher prices, and that's logical, right? When you look at the, the supply deficits that we're going to see, very, very high prices. And it just made me think, this energy crisis, and obviously the causes of this energy crisis are divorced from what we are talking about. But this energy crisis, is that a taster of what we're going to see over the next couple of decades, where we'll get these severe shortages and increases in prices for certain critical metals and the resultant political chaos that goes with it? Well, I think it depends on, on, on the pace of adoption and whether or not that pace is driven by market forces or by other factors. Um, economies have a great way of balancing supply and demand based on price. Um, and the factors to which you're alluding to arguably are less free market driven. Um, my final question, um, 
I interviewed a very interesting gentleman called Michael Sherb from Appian Capital Advisory. Mm. And he, he made a very good point. He said, James, investors, and I mentioned this because you, you raised it in your talk. He said, investors are obsessed with the technological solutions. So he said, look at the price multiples that the shares of uh, renewable energy uh, companies trade on. Mm. Look what the electric vehicle companies are trading on. Look what the battery um, are changing on. Mm. And then he said, then look at the companies that make all the metals they need to survive. Look at look at the miners. And the miners are far, far cheaper. The, mi the miners, if you're looking at uh, price to earnings multiples, they're far cheaper than all of these tech solutions. That massive disparity, do you expect that to change? Well, we're a royalty and streaming company rather than equity investors, so I'll leave that to the professionals, so to speak. But what I would say is that ultimately those valuations are fully predicated upon the materials being available. And if the 19th century was about railways and steels and the 20th century from an economic factor was driven by pharmaceuticals, loosely, healthcare innovation, tech, surely the 21st century is really about raw materials.